So I'm Brandon. I'm the lead developer of the Protomaps project. And I'm going to tell a little bit about the story of the project and my thinking around open source for the past maybe two or three years. Uh, first, a quick introduction to those that have not seen or used the project before. Uh, so what is Protomaps? Uh, it's a kind of, at this point, more of a software ecosystem of a few different parts. Uh, so it is kind of two major parts. One is, uh, I talk about it like it is a free and open source map of the world uh, built mainly on OSM. So when I say map, it's an interactive map, uh, like a slippy map, sort of similar to what you would get from, let's say, Google or Apple or Esri Maps, uh, but it's open source. And um, more technically speaking, it is a vector tile-based system that is deployed as a single file on static storage. Uh, so if you've heard the term like cloud native or cloud optimized, like with GeoTIFFs, it is sort of cloud optimized GeoTIFF for vector data. Uh, and at the very base of the system is a format called PM tiles. It is a specification in the public domain uh, that is uh, sort of tries to accomplish this cloud native vector idea. Um, and as of this point right now, um, there are Protomaps maintained implementations of PM tiles for uh, three main renderers for Map Libre that has been talked about, for Leaflet, for Open Layers. It seems like there is also like a Glio implementation now, thanks to Ivan. Um, and also, um, those are the like the those reader clients. Uh, there's also writing clients uh, for two main tiling engines. One is Tippecanoe, and the other is Planet Tiler. Uh, and there's also totally independent implementations uh, in, uh, in Martin, uh, a, a very fast Rust-based uh, tile server, uh, TileMaker, um, and also GDAL 3.8 plus. Uh, and the illustration on the left gives you some idea of what this format is. It is a sort of Hilbert curve organized, uh, Hilbert curve organized archive of tiles that's a single file. Uh, some example use cases that have come up in the past year uh, that use protomaps. Uh, so one of them is BridgeWatch, which is a sort of civic tech project by Marianne to visualize the health of the infrastructure in the United States, uh, specifically bridge, uh, uh, bridge health um, and maintenance. So this relies on a hex bin based overlay uh, that is all one PM tiles file. Uh, Soul Building Age uh, by Humbiel um, to visualize uh, sort of uh, the points of buildings in South Korea and how old they are, uh, sort of a similar project with a large data set of all the buildings in Seoul, uh, so like hundreds of thousands, uh, also just delivered as a PM tiles file, as well as a base map uh, based on OSM that is also just one PM tiles file cut out just for South Korea. Uh, plant hardiness map uh, by NPR, which is a public radio station in the US. Uh, and this is uses a base map and an overlay, uh, this thematic data from the US Department of Agriculture uh, for sort of um, how climate classification has changed over time uh, in the US uh, for, for plants. Uh, so those are all uh, these like web, those are all web map applications um, that are usually um, projects, um, not necessarily by big tech companies, but like by a radio station or by an individual. And I think the important part is that the Protomaps project lets them uh, publish a web map uh, and not have to rely on some sort of API or proprietary system to do that. Uh, so uh, this talk is not necessarily about all the technical bits of protomaps, but it's why bother with, uh, you know, like a idea like open core or so, uh, even something like source available um, or open source as a business. I know this is like FOSS for G as in free and open source software, not like open core software for geospatial. That would be like a different conference. Um, but um, so a lot of the conversations I have around open source are around uh, sustainability, but no one really knows or people haven't defined what that means. It's sort of a fuzzy term. And sometimes people think it's just like, oh, if there's money involved, then it's sustainable. 
Uh, but for me, like it's my definition of sustainability, uh, really is about the opportunity cost for, for, for a developer. So it's like you're a developer that works on free software. Well, you could just go work at, let's say, Esri and you know maybe get yeah, have a good job, but that this, that doesn't like that might pay you more than just doing FOSS. So really, like in my definition, uh, a project is sustainable if it can cover some of that opportunity cost. If what you can earn from doing FOSS as a job is competitive with doing proprietary as a job, then I think that's sustainable. Uh, there's other definitions of sustainability, uh, which is like if you have a venture capital firm that is investing in you to build tech, then maybe you do open source as part of that. But whether or not that is sustainable in the long term uh, may, or not, may or may not be true. Um, for me individually, so ProtoMaps is not a VC-backed business. Um, but I think in a lot of situations, um, especially in geospatial in the past 15 years, uh, we have seen sort of the unsustainability of open source. Uh, so for example, so outside of Geo, there's uh, some projects uh, such as MongoDB, uh, Terraform, Elasticsearch, uh, that have started their life as open source projects. Um, and recently, they have all changed their license to a non-open source license, uh, still a quite generous one like Business Source or server-side public license, uh, but this is essentially a way for those companies to uh, have a monopoly on, on providing uh, that product as an API. Um, and um, those have all you know, made sense and probably been quite successful uh, for them as a business, uh, but don't really uh, result in the continuation of open source development. Uh, maybe there's like an open source fork of those projects, uh, but those have diverged. Uh, so within geospatial, um, there has been a lot of uh, very popular projects in the past decade, uh, like CardoDB, Mapbox GeoJS, uh, CloudMade, TileMill. And those have also uh, met different fates. Uh, those um, are, have not all continued as open source projects. Uh, so MapSend uh, is no longer around. Uh, CardoDB and CloudMade have changed their focus uh, so often to things like automobile uh, and TileMill. Um, is no longer maintained, and Mapbox GL, for example, uh, like Elastic or Mongo, has been relicensed, if it makes sense for their business. Uh, so really, I think the big question over open source is this question of sustainability. Um, and I think one core um, concept within this is the idea of open source uh, being alongside some sort of SaaS business. Um, so a good example is hosted PostGIS. Uh, so you can publish PostGIS as a SaaS business, but sell hosting on the side, uh, like have a PostGIS as a service, so the software is all open source. Um, but this like sort of self-hosting idea is not necessarily in the interest of businesses that develop open source. Uh, if it's self-hosted, you set up a server, uh, but if it's hosted, we, you can also pay us to do it. Uh, so this sort of um, relies on the software inherently being quite complex. Because if your pitch as a business is that it is too hard for you to do individually, then it makes a lot of sense for you to host it as a business. Uh, so usually, like when we talk about like if you are choosing between different products, um, if there is a nice hosted version, then that makes sense to pay for. Um, so really, it's a conflict between open source as a collaboration model versus SaaS as a business model. And I think um, more and more, SaaS has proved itself to be the best business model in most cases for a couple of core reasons. Uh, so I identify three reasons why SaaS is really the best business model ever for software. Um, and I'll go over quite quickly a few of these. Um, like SaaS is very fast to adopt. Uh, there's usually some sort of freemium tier that you don't have to like install. You don't have to do a Conda install or a pip install and have these dependencies, like is it in Homebrew or whatever, uh, or no issues with it not working on my machine. SaaS is just an API you can get started with for free. Um, and SaaS also adds some DRM. Uh, so it, uh, if you have a SaaS business, well, some parts of that deployment don't, uh, are not part of the open source projects. Uh, you can kind of keep it private. Uh, you can meter the access to that product by having a tiered amount of plans. And if people don't pay up, then you can terminate their access uh, to your API. So DRM is really a feature of the SaaS business. 
And uh, price discrimination, I think, is also a very strong one, which is that, like I was saying, if you are a hobbyist or a radio station or a newspaper, you might have, have a small budget. But if you have this sort of metered usage, then maybe like with PostGIS, if you only have uh, a light usage of the database, you don't pay anything. But if you are a big enterprise, then you pay a lot. So SAS is pretty good at achieving this kind of price discrimination. Uh, but really, um, SAS is, some, is something that I decided was not the right choice for ProtoMaps as a project, uh, because it relies on the open source project being difficult to deploy. And that influences the design of the software. Uh, for me, uh, the killer feature of ProtoMaps as a project is it is easy. It is just a file on S3. Uh, the other issue with SAS is that if you publish open source, then other businesses can so-called freeload, which is also like not necessarily like a, a great term because businesses like Amazon, they do contribute back to open source. You know, they may have, like a business like Amazon can hire maintainers, but really the conflict is between the company that is developing open source is investing most of the resources in the R and D and maybe less on marketing. But if someone else can, uh, can monetize that software, then they bear almost none of the cost or a minority of the cost to develop the software and maybe spend it better on marketing. And it seems like they have an inherent advantage. So I think this tension between SaaS and, um, and FOSS is unresolved. Um, for me, uh, I have a SaaS component as part of ProtoMaps, but it is purely supported through GitHub sponsors. If you want to use the API and get an API key for commercial use, just become a GitHub sponsor. And uh, so thanks to the 40 plus sponsors that are doing that right now. Uh, so moving on to other models for open source sustainability, uh, something like open core I think is pretty interesting where part of the project or the core of the project is open source, but there might be some part that is proprietary or uses a non fos license. Uh, for example, uh, having enterprise features as a non-FOSS part or having prepackaged builds as non-FOSS. Um, some examples of uh, ways to, to try this kind of model for a geo project um, or for, for web development in general, like Tailwind is, is quite good at doing this uh, if you've used Tailwind CSS. So Tailwind CSS has a core of a CSS framework for styling and also has a UI framework that is proprietary. Um, so it's uh, quite a clever combination of a open source project and a proprietary project. That seems like it's doing quite well for, for sustaining the open source project. Uh, so for example, we could have uh, PM tiles as an open core and then have some sort of uh, data product like built on OSM as a proprietary product. Uh, so, or we can even have um, some enterprise feature like CDN integration with Lambda or Cloudflare as the proprietary part. Uh, just a bit of detail on this because I've had some questions about it. Uh, so using PM tiles on static storage like S3 is the most simple way to use it in a cloud native way. But if you wanted to use it for a higher traffic use case, like you wanted to uh, serve uh, ZXY or WTMS tiles, uh, from private buckets, or you wanted backwards compatibility with, let's say, a legacy uh, web mapping system, or you wanted to have edge caching uh, for lower latency map loading. Uh, those could all be enterprise features. Um, so these were both uh, things that I had uh, as part of the open core project for about a year or two. Uh, so it's, you can put this CDN and integrate with Lambda and workers, but those were proprietary. Um, or you can have, uh, so these two components, the base map and CDN integration as outside of the open core of PM tiles. Um, or have a data store where you can go in and you can download a, you know, the full data product as a commercial license. Um, or even have a commercial use license with support, you know, for a flat fee. Uh, this was uh, this was quite an interesting product to run uh, with, you know, like a couple of good customers. Um, and reasons I did not pursue this in the long term were that um, one, it's quite hard to adopt. If you're asking people to adopt new technology, then they should be able to try it for free. Um, 
but changing people's behavior around how to deploy maps is quite challenging. And there's no real way to like add a licensing server. You know, like if the benefit of having um, your map deployment be easy is you can use it offline. But actually validating that offline usage requires talking to a licensed server. Well, it's very annoying, and I think people have become frustrated with that kind of, you know, like that kind of hoop you have to jump through. That is there purely for the license validation reasons, and not really for any technical good reason. Uh, so that is quite difficult to implement. Uh, not really a, a way to work out in, in the long term. Uh, trust is another big part, which is that if you're a small company uh, trying to sell some proprietary component of an otherwise open source system, well, any big uh, adopter will will realize that you know you're not a big company, and they'll say, oh, you know what happens uh, if uh, this business changes, uh, w which it does, um, and that is also a big risk uh, to try to sell proprietary software as a small company. Um, and the ecosystem um, for an open core project is inherently um, challenging because it relies on some part, often the most important part, being proprietary. Uh, so if somebody else uh, implements an alternative for that proprietary feature, then that cannot be accepted into the ecosystem because uh, your business relies on one part being proprietary. Uh, so uh, that sort of hard boundary between the open core and the proprietary bit is also difficult to reconcile in the long term. Uh, so the base maps build uh, was uh, open core, and now it's open source. So you can just go download a OpenStreetMap based build that's about 110 gigabytes uh, for free online. It's built once a day. Uh, the CDN integration, uh, which is uh, to run it on Amazon or Cloudflare, uh, that was a proprietary code before, and now that is uh, just part of the public documentation. And there was instructions to do that in about 20 minutes online. Uh, so, uh, how does this continue as a FOSS project? Um, uh, one of the things that has changed um, is uh, these open source grants. Um, and uh, being able to find grants uh, has uh, been possible by focusing on what are the unique parts of the project that are appealing to potential open source grant funding organizations. Uh, so one of them is localization. Um, uh, if you've used MapLibre before, uh, you might have uh, heard that MapLibre does not support all the languages in the world, and that's a barrier to adoption for open source in a lot of countries. Uh, for example, uh, in Asia, where actually most people live, um, like there's more people inside this, this circle than outside of it, like quick geofact. Um, but uh, so a lot of the languages that are used officially here are, are not supported by any, are not supported by MapLibre. Um, so as part of this project, uh, so with NLNet, which is a uh, European open source funding program, we've applied and gotten a grant uh, to work on Indic script rendering, which requires uh, some coordination between the MapLibre front end and the ProtoMaps uh, back end or tile set. Um, and this has just been published as a blog post by Oliver, uh, who's the coordinator for MapLibre. So if you're curious about uh, this work, uh, you can check out Oliver's blog. Um, but uh, so right now, um, the main focus in terms of open source grants for ProtoMaps is really on localization. And that's what we're going to be working on for most of the rest of this year. Um, so the next steps, uh, more languages, uh, more public sector adoption, because we have found that to be a pretty good uh, specialized use case uh, is being able to adopt something like PM tiles in government. Uh, a main advantage of that is you can just use, like, let's say, static storage on, um, you know, on Scaleway, OVH, um, sort of those GDPR compliant uh, storage buckets uh, for web mapping and not have to use some proprietary vendor or even run open source server code. It's just a static cloud native file. Um, and also delivering new data sets in PM tiles format. Uh, the Overture Maps project um, has been publishing monthly releases of OSM combined with other data. So those are also going to be made available in the PM tiles format pretty soon. Um, and uh, hearing about more use cases uh, at this conference. So 
if you'd like to talk more about ways that you can use this or ways that your company might be able to uh, get certain features uh, into the open source code, uh, you can talk to me at the conference, contact me, or find us on GitHub. Uh, thanks, and a little early, so great, thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for plenty of questions. So. Thanks, Brandon. Um, the path you're going, I see, is like going towards services, providing services around the open source project um, and getting paid for that. How do you see this being taken into account of like the sustainability um, um, perspective if in terms of like planning security? Because I think like if you have a product like SaaS, you know you have your customers, you will probably have um, them for a longer time, but with services, you could have a contract now, but you don't have one tomorrow, so how do you see that? I think that's still a risk, but I think um, one thing I've learned is that the deployment model people have a lot of confidence in. So one downside of sort of a um, server-based application is there's a constant um, churn of like security issues if you have code running. Um, and that inherently demands some sort of long-term maintenance. But this um, sort of cloud-native approach, um, in my experience, um, companies are very happy to adopt because it eliminates a lot of those potential issues. Um, so I think that it's almost a disadvantage for a service-based company to have this cloud-native approach because there's no code you can point at and be like, hey, you know, this might have some vulnerability next year. Um, but I would say expanding the audience to more organizations um, inherently creates more opportunities for funding just because the overall simplicity is an advantage. Yeah. More questions?